Welcome to the Alpha Concepts Podcast, where we talk about everything going on in the gun culture, from training to gear and gun rights advocacy. Hi, I'm your host, Thomas Crawl, and I will be with you on this adventure that we're going on together. And today's podcast, I have a very special guest, Julie Gallup, who is a professional shooter and an all-around excellent ambassador of the shooting sports. Julie, thank you for being on the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Um, I want to, uh, we're going to go into your lengthy resume, but uh, <laughs> I just want to say when I first became aware of you, it was uh, several years ago, um, maybe around 10 ish or so years ago. Uh, I had always been a casual gun owner, but I was just starting to get very serious into it. And uh, here's this, uh, this young, very articulate woman who is on every single shooting TV show that there is. Uh, doing an excellent job of explaining the fundamentals and the basics and, you know, things that uh, every shooter needs to know. And I've learned so much from you um, back then and still to this day. Uh, I, I watch your videos. I share your videos with my own students. Uh, and um, the number one most important thing that I learned from you uh has really nothing to do with the fundamentals of shooting, but what you taught me was that shooting isn't just for guys, um, because obviously you're not, and uh, <laughs> you're you're very you're excellent at it. So, um, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Wow, you've done a great job so far. <laughs> um, but uh, I I actually began shooting with my father in upstate New York of all places, and uh, really it it just became this you know, father daughter hobby that we had. And, and I fell in love with the shooting sports, mostly because of the people in them. And uh, when I was 14, my dad and I decided I was old enough and strong enough and, and capable enough to actually start competing. And that kind of created a snowball effect. I, I fell in love with the sport of practical shooting and eventually ended up shooting for the United States Army on their shooting. Team. So was that the marksmanship unit that you were uh, in? Yes, correct. The Army marksmanship unit. Cool. So I served there, yeah, for about eight years. So I served there for about eight years and uh, and then got out to work in the firearms industry. But, you know, being in the military and being able to shoot for the Army Marksmanship Unit at AMU um, really laid the foundation for everything and who I am today as far as a shooter. Uh, my dad taught me those fundamentals, right, The all of the little things that you need to learn in order to, you know, hit your target and the trigger control and that sort of stuff. But really being in the Army, it just, took it to a whole new level. Absolutely. You have the time and the resources to, to hone your craft when uh, the government's paying for your ammo. This is true. <laughs> Very <laughs> Especially true. Especially nowadays, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, you got out of the Army, went into the firearm industry. You've got currently numerous sponsors. I believe Smith & Wesson is your big one. Am I correct in that? That is correct. Were they like your first sponsor or um, was that just something that you uh, worked up to? Because, you know, obviously they're a big name in the industry. Oh, yeah. It's actually a little bit of a funny story um, in how everything circles back around. When I was a junior competitor, before the Army picked me up to shoot, uh, Smith & Wesson actually was my very first sponsor. They sent me a firearm from the Performance Center, and I was competing with it, and then I enlisted. Um, but it's funny how things come full circle. I did uh, work for Glock for a bit. Um, before Smith & Wesson whisked me away <laughs> to represent them and, uh, and shoot for them. That's great. That's great that it, you know, I tell people all the time, we've got to get the juniors involved. We've got to get the youth involved because that's, you know, the future of everything, right? Especially of the shooting sports, especially of the gun culture. We've got to get the youth active and involved and at a young age, start planting the, the seeds. And so it's excellent that Smith & Wesson is doing that and planting the seeds and helping sponsor juniors so that they can flourish and grow. And as they, as they age, they're going to grow and they're going to, their appreciation and their, their love for the shooting sports is, is going to, uh, to get deeper. Well, it's a trickle-down effect. I mean, when they sponsored me, gosh, that was many, many years ago, <laughs> like 20 plus. Um, but it, you know, it just shows you exactly what you said. You know, when you have that, uh, you know, sharing of a passion of between responsible gun ownership and Second Amendment rights to young shooters, youth shooters, it's something that they carry on throughout their entire lives and onto their own kids. So. It's definitely um, something that I'm proud of, and it's it's a neat thing. And it's something that you're now, you know, paying back because you've written a few books that are geared towards uh, children. If I remember correctly, one is like for the kids to read, and the other is for the parents to help explain to the kids. Um, am I correct? Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, 
I wrote a book called Toys, Tools, Guns, and Rules. It's for very young children to learn about the the universal message of gun avoidance that we always teach our kids, you know, stop, don't touch, go tell an adult kind of thing. Um, and then I also wrote um, a small ebook guide with that that helps parents have the discussion with their kids at a variety of different ages. It's something, you know, it's something we have to do. It's, it's just like anything else. We, talk, we teach our kids about hot stoves and knives and what to do in a tornado and <laughs> all of these things. And it's, it's important that we have that open, honest discussion about firearms, too. You know, I was having a conversation with, uh, I believe he was another instructor, um, but uh, we were just chatting on social media and um, we were talking about that topic, about uh, uh, child safety with, uh, with firearms. And uh, he made a comment that I told him that's the excellent way of putting it. I'm going to steal it. And so I, I get to steal it and use it today. He said, talk to your children about gun safety. The only thing you have to lose is them. And I was like, wow, that is, I mean, it just hammers home the point. It truly does. It truly does. You know, the kids have so many different pressures from around. And, and, and if you teach your children the right thing to do, it can diffuse the situation with other children as well. It's just it's just the right thing to do. Absolutely. And it's the point you said about the knives, right? Every household in America, well, I shouldn't say every, right? Because you can never be absolute. But let's say 99% of households in America, the knives are in the kitchen drawer completely um, uh, unrestricted because we trust our children. We have given them that, uh, that knowledge, that information, that baseline respect that they need. And, and, you know, all tools are, 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 sh- are, or should be like that. Yeah, exactly. What do you have going on these days? Are you still competing full time or is uh Corona kind of put a, a damper on that? Uh, you know, COVID has put uh, a damper on a lot of things. Um, this, uh, October. And in fact, I wouldn't, actually be in Australia right now to compete at the World Action Pistol Championships. But like so many things, um, like the Olympics, it's been postponed until next year. Um, And so for this particular season, because so many events were canceled or rescheduled, um, and plus uh, we have an immune compromised family member in our household, uh, you know, it just kind of ended up being one of those years that we focus on other things like writing and and sharing fundamentals with new shooters and and uh, doing a lot of video work instead. There will always be competitions and that, that, that sort of stuff. But uh, this year is definitely <laughs> like so many things that Corona has done for us made it a challenge. Well, it's OK. You would have won it anyway. You've got like 50 <laughs> national titles. So. Well, it's always hard work. And I'll tell you, you these young whippersnappers, they're coming up and they're good. <laughs> Absolutely. If you're not moving forward, you're falling behind because there's someone always trying to take your place. Definitely. So um, 50 titles is a tremendous uh, accomplishment. Congratulations. I mean, that just speaks volumes. Do you have any world records like your friend Jerry Micklick? So, you know, first of all, Jerry is an absolute phenom, right? Like you could just say. He's a machine. It's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> um, I don't have a fast finger quite like Jerry. Well, let's face it. Nobody really does. Right. Um, but I do have some uh, some national and world records with regard to the shooting sports specifically. Um, most of them are in NRA Action Pistol um, with the, the Yankee Cup style shooting. Uh, this, it's one of those things. Jerry's. I call him the shooting world showman, right? He's the greatest showman in, in the shooting sports because he's not only an, an incredible competitor with so many wins in the books, um, but he's such a showman as well. And he shares it so well with everybody on YouTube and Facebook. And if you get to see a demo of his in person, jump at it, like drive however many miles to go see it because it's truly phenomenal. I'm more of a boring shooter. <laughs> I just like hitting targets in the middle and as quick as possible. Um, but Jerry is, Jerry is really something else. Yeah, but it's like I said, you know, uh, those fundamentals, you called boring, but those fundamentals are important because they're the baseline. You can't do what Jerry does until you can you can do the, the basics. You have to build from there. Absolutely. So obviously this year has been pretty dead, pretty slow with the, um, the competition. And you're in different... Um, Leagues, USPSA, IDPA, um, uh, IPSC, all of those. What, um, what? There's differences between each because of the rules and, and how you have to compete. Like IDPA makes you sometimes compete, uh, hit the targets in a certain order, whereas USPSA is a little bit more uh, lenient on that. What's your favorite uh, 
um, league to, to be shooting in? Oh, it's such a hard question. I appreciate all of them. I wouldn't do them if I didn't enjoy them. And truthfully, I haven't found a shooting sport I didn't enjoy. Um, I think that uh, for me, it'll always be uh, practical shooting. So USPSA, IPSC will always uh, be a first love for me since that's where I kind of cut my teeth uh, in the sport. But IDPA is a ton of fun. Steel Challenge is a ton of fun. There's really so many draw from a holster shooting sports out there now that are easily accessible far more than when I was a kid um, that you really have so many options to choose from. And the nice thing about most places in the U.S., um, you have multiple clubs in an area, so you can shoot IDPA one weekend and USPSA the next weekend, and it's really a neat thing to be able to do. So if I had to narrow it down, I would definitely say USPSA, IPSC, which is the practical shooting where your points are divided by your time and you have the freedom to choose how you want to run a course of fire. It's a lot of fun. Right. I I think that for me, the way my brain works, if you said you've got to shoot target one, two, three, four, five, but in my mind, I'm thinking I want to do one, three, two, five or something like that, then that's just going to confuse me. <laughs> well, you know, IDPA has also had a lot of, of rule changes in relatively recent history. And it, it's funny because now IDPA is a lot like the original USPSA. It's funny how things, you know, change. But generally speaking, you need to shoot the closest target first and uh, or the, the target that you see first. After that, it's pretty simple. But sometimes you get one of those brain teasers in there where you're like, what am I doing? <laughs> How do I do this again? So it's fun. So you uh, obviously you have some videos talking about your single stacks. And uh, obviously, you're also a double stack shooter. Which do you prefer? Oh, so that's, you know, that's a big difference between, uh, you know, a striker fired gun, my MMPs or a 1911. I, I started on a 1911, so it's always going to be near and dear to me. I, there's just something about it, especially in nine millimeter these days. Uh, you know, back when I first started shooting, it was 45 and that was it. <laughs> and we downloaded it big time so that it would, uh, would work well for me. But, uh, nine millimeter 1911s are really something special for, competition and i really enjoy shooting them in classic and single stack division but for like real carry life and defensive situations and house guns and that sort of thing i'm not using a 1911 <laughs> definitely not i'm trusting an mp for that i am so happy you brought that up because i asked you an open-ended question i said which do you prefer but i didn't give you the criteria to answer so you definitely clarified and and I would agree with you that uh, you know the 1911 um, isn't the best uh, defensive tool. Obviously, there's capacity issues and and uh, you know the trigger being so light. If someone doesn't have that proper discipline on their trigger finger, could have a negligent discharge. And definitely, you know, I have, I have students show up to my defensive pistol classes, and and I make it very clear: bring your defensive gear so you can train with your defensive gear because we're doing defensive techniques. And then they show up with their, uh, you know, 1911 tricked out with, uh, you know, the open carry holster for fast draws and everything. And I think that students don't get the training value. Um, obviously, if you're going to compete, you compete with uh, your your competition setup, and but you you should also. Uh, and you're going to be more accurate because it's designed for that. And you're, you know, the trigger press is so much lighter because it's designed and built for that. But some of those skills transfer over and some of them don't because sometimes when you're shooting to split seconds, um, doesn't quite transfer over to um, the defensive world into real life applications. And obviously, again, a lot of those skills do, and, and competition is great for honing those skills. I'm wondering, in your opinion, um, what are some training scars or what, what are some things uh, from competition that uh, don't necessarily, in your opinion, transfer over to real-life applications? Well, I, I think that you know the first thing you have to acknowledge is that shooting sports are games, right? They're games. They're, they're not training for real life scenarios. Um, if any time you put somebody on a clock and give them a scoring zone, uh, you lose that element of, of, of decision-making and being able to shoot at a pace that's necessary for the situation that you're in. So that said, I do believe that shooting sports, especially the, you know, the more intense gun handling shooting sports, 
really do build confidence with one, being able to shoot and two, uh, and hit a target accurately and two, the gun handling skills required. So for sh- from shooting sports, I've learned how to reload a gun quickly and, and, and efficiently, right? And uh, if you don't do that a lot and you only practice, uh, you know, your accuracy on the range and you do carry a firearm and you do need to reload, you know, that could be an, an issue, especially if you're stressed. Whereas reloads are something that I've done so many times, I can't even tell you how many times I've reloaded a variety of different you know, firearms, even, you know, revolvers, I've learned how to do that. So having those advanced gun handling skills and the confidence of being able to maneuver safely with your firearm is so important um, that, you know, it's definitely a benefit if you, you know, when it comes to translating over to that kind of real life situation. But you always have to remember, um, especially when IDPA first came out, people thought it was like, oh, this is great training self-defense training. Now, (laughs) this is a game. This is a shooting sport. It is not defensive training. If you want defensive training, then you need to, you know, use a firearm and gear that's specific to that, that you're going to be using in real life. And then also go and seek good training opportunities to ensure that you're going to be as proficient as possible. Absolutely. And, you know, you said you've reloaded more times than you can count. Um, I think, Anyone who has been uh, shooting for a few years even should be able to say that because, let's face it, you can sit in your house and uh, as you're watching TV, sit there and work on that, uh, building that muscle memory, reloading the uh, the firearm using snap caps, uh, dummy rounds. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's a great way to, to build the muscle memory and become uh, unconsciously competent with those manipulations. Um, you know, a, a lot of times we think we have to be doing these things live fire, and obviously that's a lot more fun, right? But at the same point in time, uh, crawl before you walk. And uh, these things at, at a basic beginner's level, uh, I tell my students, you know, I had a class last week in a basic concealed carry class, and most of the people in the class had never even touched a firearm before. And because of uh, recent events that are going on across the nation, they uh, have realized that. Uh, only they are responsible for their own safety and no one's coming to save them. They have to save themselves. And so people are really starting to get involved. And in years past, you know, the, the students have been, I've been shooting for years, but I finally decided to take the class. And then this year it's, as I said, most of the people have never even touched a firearm before, or haven't touched a firearm in decades. And, and I go over the dry fire techniques in, in the class, things that they can do to uh, hone those skills. And, and I'm curious what, uh, what types of dry fire, I mean, obviously, you know, video would help explain, right? But with words, if you can maybe kind of explain some of the drills that you might recommend dry fire for a new shooter to uh, kind of do at home. Absolutely. I mean, the first step is just gun familiarity. There's so many people I've seen that will purchase a firearm and, and, and when they bring it home, they open the case up and they're like, all right, now what would, what did that button do again? Okay. What was this for? You know, and they really aren't, aren't familiar with it. Um, and so especially with semi-automatic pistols, for example, being able to have good trigger finger discipline while you're racking the slide. Uh, making sure that you're aware of muzzle direction. Set up a, you know, a room in your house. It's almost like a range where you have a, you can practice what it would be like going to a range for the first time. And then once you have that confidence, you can work on lining up the sights and pulling the trigger, obviously with no ammunition around. And you can use anything from sticky notes to buying dry fire targets or whatever you like as an aiming point on the wall. And then as you you feel more confident there, Working through those fundamentals, you can incorporate more advanced skills like drawing from a holster, learning how to pick up a firearm quickly and efficiently off of the table, how to reload, that sort of thing. You can even practice, you know, aiming around doorways, corners, that sort of stuff. There's really so much that you can do in dry fire. And even if you're interested in competition, you can do that as well. I mean, there's there's so many people out there who don't have access to a lot of ammunition or ranges all the time, and they're still extremely proficient in competition because they spend so much time setting up mini courses in their basement and just practice it in dry fire. 
Yeah, I mean, I have cert pistols, and uh, those, for anyone unfamiliar, those are uh, basic, basically inert laser training pistols, and uh, I use them in, in classes, but I use them myself, and I'll say, yeah, there isn't a light switch in the house that I haven't shot a million <laughs> times, uh, yeah. you know. I'll, I'll just draw from the holster and, and put a couple sh uh, shots on target or as I'm watching TV in a commercial breaks, so I put a few shots on the light switch, uh, you know, making sure my sights are aligned, making sure my trigger press is perfect. And, and I'll be honest with you, uh, uh, I thought I had a good uh, consistent trigger press until I got the, the first cert pistol and I was like, okay, yeah, there was definitely room for improvement. So, um, it, you know, laser popping a light at a light switch, uh, with that laser pistol doesn't cost anything beyond the initial uh, purchase. I haven't even replaced the batteries yet, and I've had them for <laughs> I don't even know how many years. Yeah, no, the cert's a really great tool, especially you know for that repetitive trigger figure. Like if you want to work on your your speed or, or learning reset, obviously you need to make sure the model corresponds with the main firearm that you're using all the time. But it definitely can improve those things. And they sell. I don't know. I don't know if uh, the manufacturer of cert sells them, but they work nonetheless. You can buy those uh, pop can targets where, when uh, the laser hits the target, they'll actually flip and pop over, just like as if you were actually shooting it with a BB gun or a twenty two or something. Um, and those are really nice for uh, children because you get that immediate uh, interaction. Uh, you know, oh, I hit it because you know it popped in the air and it, and it flipped over, and that's uh, kind of a cute training tool for for children. I found. Mm hmm. And let's face it, adults too. <laughs> true, very true. So uh, on your website, and you have a few, but on juliegollub.com, I'm looking at it right now, and you have free downloads, and uh, a couple of them are the uh, the uh, the toys, tools, guns for, for children that, uh, you know, the parent's guide for kids, how to speak to your child about guns. Uh, you also have one, and, and this is this is great because I was going to ask you this 50 round CCW maintenance drill. So I was going to ask you what are your, and I'm assuming you're going to tell me what's on this uh, download, but what are your, uh, you know, I have my own routine when I go to the range. I like to practice what I'm good at. I like to practice what I'm not good at. And I think that's even more important, but so that I remember to practice this thing, the things that I, I am not good at, I've come up with my own uh, specific routine. So what, uh, what's your typical, uh, uh, routine when you go to the range, when you're actually getting some one-on-one -on -one time just by yourself um, and you're, you're getting a little bit of shooting and you're working on uh, your skills, do you work? F uh, you, I would assume if you've got a, a if you've got a uh, event coming up, you're going to practice specifically for that event with that gun that you're going to be using. But when it comes to defensive, what, what is your routine? Sure. Sure. You're absolutely right. Like I, when I'm on the range for what I call work, um, for shooting competitions, that sort of thing. I'm very focused on specific skills I need to work on for that sport. But when it comes to, you know, carry, um, it, it's one of those things that I like to start a session with a realistic test, um, of a comparison, if you will. So one of the really good drills out there is the fast drill. Um, and you can, you can look that up. It's, it was designed by the late Todd Green and it's, it's, it's a quick, easy thing. It involves a slide lock reload, involves a draw, but it really gives you an idea of your on-demand performance, right? And I think that's a really important thing when you're training and practicing for defense or, or concealed carry. Because a lot of times people will go to the range and just, you know, get out their firearm and, and do some group shooting, get settled in, and then they'll test themselves at the end. You can certainly, you know, perform the test later on, you know, your beginning time versus your end time and compare that sort of thing. Um, but I think it's a really important skill um, to test your ability to perform on demand. And this is something that um, is different in competition because we're in competition, you know, we may uh, you know, be really striving to be really fast or really perfect or whatever, whereas, you know, in your training for personal and self-defense, this is, you know, a, a point in time where you, you can't really, you know, say, Oh, well, that D zone hit was okay. You know, <laughs> like, Oh, you know, I'll take it. I'll take the, the bad shot place, placement on this one. You really have to make sure that you're watching your sights, whatever they may be. And then after that, um, you know, I'll have some specific things like working on draws consistently. Thankfully, you know, you can do a lot of that in dry fire. So again, it's more testing. I definitely like to practice accuracy as well. I think a lot of people overlook 
um, you know, concealed carry accuracy because most of the time, you know, you're going to be practicing three to seven yards. But it's really a good idea to see what you're capable of at 15, 20, even 25 yards. Um, and, and, you know, incorporate these things. Now, of course, it all depends on how much time you have. But you you have to be honest with yourself and know what your weaknesses are. Um, be ready to test everything, you know, uh, that matters in those types of situations. But then look at ways you can constantly improve as well. Absolutely. Um, the old saying, aim small, miss small. The further back you go, you know, so we, we know defensive situations uh, typically are three yards or, or less in, in most scenarios. Obviously, they can be further back. But um, if we're not being challenged at those close distances, then a great way to uh, make things more difficult for us, for our training purposes, is simply to push the target back right. um, because that then makes uh, everything just a little bit harder and a little bit harder. And and if you're good at those further away distances, and, and it might just be five yards going from three yards to five yards, and then once you've got that dialed in, then push it back to seven yards. And once you've got that dialed in, then push it back to 10 yards. And once you've got that dialed in, wash, rinse, repeat. And, and the better you are, the further away, the better you are, you're going to be up close, just your cone of deviation. You're going to have the fundamentals. You're going to have a firm grip, so you're not going to, you know, all of that put together at a further distance. Um, and you're going to have the confidence. You're going to have the confidence because you're going to know if I can hit it at 21 feet, I can hit it at nine feet. Definitely. So let's talk about competition. Um, let's say a new shooter, you know, obviously it can be really overwhelming, right? You've got all this gear and you've got a million different firearms designed specifically for competition. And, oh, you know, I, I've just got a pump 870, but here's this, uh, uh, you know, $1,200 FN uh, shotgun designed for competition. And all oh, these 1911s, you know, I'm just carrying a, <laughs> uh, you know, Glock 19, but these 1911s are like three, $4,000. I mean, it can be super overwhelming for someone that wants to uh, start with competition. And you and I both know it doesn't have to be. So what's your advice for someone that just wants to uh, get their feet wet with uh, the shooting sports, the competition? Yeah, sure. You know, the the shooting sports has, has really caught on to the idea of, oh, we should have divisions with the, the guns that people actually own. <laughs> so it's usually called uh, a stock gun division or a production gun division, but it's basically um, a, a firearm that has very minimal modifications to it. And it's it's going to be something that you could pick up at your your local gun shop. Um, you know, you could grab an M&P compact and certainly head to the range with a safe holster and start shooting steel challenge. Easy peasy, right? Um, buy a couple magazine pouches and a couple of extra magazines and you're ready to compete in IDPA as long as you have a good belt. And then in USPSA, you'll want to add a couple more mag pouches to that. But the same concept is there. So if you have one gun, like an M&P compact, and you have a safe, secure holster that you've got a belt four and you have a few mag pouches, you can now go compete in three different shooting sports and actually be somewhat competitive. Um, it's, it's not one of those situations where you're going to be so behind the power curve because in a lot of these divisions, there's a, a, a capacity max anyway. So uh, everybody's an, on an even playing field with the round count and you just, you know, you just go and have fun. Um, a lot of people think that uh, what you see on Instagram <laughs> <laughs> with amazing fast GM shooters and stuff like that is what you have to do in order to go compete. It's absolutely not the case. The shooting sports have classification systems that allow you to be shooting against someone of like ability. So if you're new, you're going to be unclassified and you're going to be shooting against unclassified shooters. And then eventually you'll be classified and get to move up to the highest levels if you, you know, if you work at it. So it's, it's really a neat thing. And you said, go have fun. That's the most important thing. I tell uh, my students, you know, get out there and do a few competitions and get your feet wet. And like you said, just bring what you have. Shoot what you already have. And, and who cares if you win or lose in the beginning? Don't expect to win. You're competing against yourself. You're, you're having fun. You're going to go back the next time. You're going to get a little bit better the next time. You're going to learn what skills you need to work on. You're going to learn what gear you need to buy. You don't have to go out and buy $1,000 worth of, uh, of gear and $100 uh, holsters if you already have a safe holster. And mag pouches are cheap. And, you know, and, and just get out there and, and 
have fun and you're going to do it again and again, and then you're going to get better and better. Definitely. It, you know, I think one of my favorite shooting sports to, to tell people to get started in is a steel challenge because again, you don't even have to have magazine pouches. You can reload right from the table if you have to. And so if you're shooting a center fire division, you need to have a holster. But if you have a 22, which is a fantastic way to get started in shooting sports, you start from the low ready. So already now all you need is a bag, a couple of extra magazines and your ammo and you're ready to go play. And you'll have so much fun. There's, there are a few things that are more fun than listening to steel ring. <laughs> yeah, ding, 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 ding. It's, it's, it's even fun to watch just to listen to the steel. You get that immediate uh, reaction. You know if it's a hit or a miss without any uh, second thoughts. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. What, uh, what plans do you have for next year? I mean, obviously everything is... Nothing is definite right now, <laughs> but what, what are the, what's on the horizon? You know, obviously you've got some, some competitions you're planning, but what else is going on in your world that you, you have, uh, hoping to accomplish in the coming year? Sure. Um, if, if everything goes as planned and it's another world championship year and it doesn't get delayed for another one, I'll be heading to Australia, which will be a ton of fun. <laughs> uh, I'm on the U.S. team for Action Pistol. And uh, because of that, my year will be very focused on that specific sport. It's a, an event that doesn't happen every year. So it's, it's one of those that you want to plan for. So I'll be doing that. Um, you know, I COVID has taught us many things, and, and uh, I have a little budding farm here that <laughs> we've acquired animals for. I have lots of chickens and stuff like that, so uh, I have two daughters, and we have a lot of fun doing that sort of thing uh, and just, you know, being outside, enjoying the outdoors and, and uh, family life in that sense because there's one thing this year has taught me is that to just treasure everything that you have, you know, and, and uh, a lot of people are you know, really challenged right now. And uh, it's really important to, to value what you have and, uh, and try to find the bright side of things. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're right. Sometimes it's hard to look at the bright side when the media is constantly hammering <laughs> us with uh, negativity. Yeah. But there, there's a lot of good going on uh, in the world right now as well. A lot of people have had the opportunity to, uh, to, to start little adventures on the side that they've never, you know, air quotes, had the time to, to do. Now they've uh, lost all excuses and they've had the time to, to do some of these things that they've had on the back burner. So there's always a silver lining. Uh, there's always something to be learned. Um, yeah, learning uh, to, to cherish the things we already have is definitely some, uh, a lesson 2020 has, has uh, taught us, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, for all those new gun owners out there, seems like I've had more questions this year than ever <laughs> and being able to, you know, put together content for them and to be there to answer their questions. It's, it's a very rewarding thing. It's so exciting to have so many new gun owners into the fold from all different walks of life. I, I think that we're just growing into this vast community and it's, it's really a neat thing. I'm so happy you said that people are reaching out to you asking questions because, um, you know, my personal belief and personal opinion about firearm training is that every single uh, firearm owner should get training. It should never be mandated by the government. It should always be voluntary. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of gun owners, the new gun owners, this has been a record-breaking year. The National Shooting Sports Foundation had said millions of uh, brand-new gun owners within the first six months, if I remember correctly. And um, it's just great that now they're taking that next step to becoming responsible gun owners and, and getting the training. And like I said, I have sent your videos. I've sent my students to your videos because you do just an awesome job of um, breaking things down, just really just simple. You know, you're one of the original, what I'll say, internet instructors, right? Now the Instagram's full of them, YouTube's full of them, and there's a lot of good ones and there's some bad ones too. Uh, but you just have a way of explaining things to, to people that is just kind of really just basic plain language. Uh, you're obviously not screaming at them like some of the, uh, the military guys uh, have a tendency to do, and that can... <laughs> 
turn off a, a new shooter when the instructor is, uh, you know, barking at them. Um, so, so that's great that people are reaching out. Uh, obviously you've got numerous, uh, different, uh, social media, which I'll let you uh, throw a, a shout out, uh, in a little bit because, uh, we've got a lot more to talk about, but, um, do you teach, do you actually have, do you do classes? Like obviously not this year, right. But do you actually do like a clinics or classes, uh, where the public can come and, and work with you face to face? I do not. Um, there have been a few opportunities where I could have, um, but I have two little girls at home. And uh, between a very busy competition season or work season for me, um, between you know working with various different sponsors and, and R&D stuff, that sort of thing, I just don't have the time to, to sure. travel and dedicate to it. Uh, eventually, maybe down the road, that's something when my kids are a little older, um, it's something to, to think about, but, uh, right now, no, which is why I spend most of my instruction as you, I love it, internet instructor, <laughs> um, what you said. Um, but I spend a lot of, of time doing things of that nature, uh, you know, on the web because it's easy access. It's, it's something that everybody can get to and it doesn't involve me traveling anywhere or taking additional time to reach a much smaller number of people. Sure. And you know what the thing is, like I said, there are a lot of good internet instructors and you don't always need to be face to face with an internet instructor, uh, with an instructor, I'm sorry, to, uh, learn some of the basics, like, uh, getting a good grip, getting a good holster draw, how to reload, um, you know, uh, yes, definitely you want to have, uh, an instructor at some point standing next to you, watching you pointing out little subtleties about, uh, you know, move your thumbs here. Why don't you squeeze a little harder? That sort of thing. Um, you know, you got a little too much trigger finger, a little less trigger finger, whatever the situation dictates, it's always good to have that instructor there. But Hey, if you want to learn how to clean your, your M and P, just go to YouTube and type in how to clean my M and P and you're going <laughs> to have, I mean, right. Because you don't want yeah. your gun to be so dirty that it's uh you've got carbon and 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 all the dust and everything getting all over if you touch your gun and your hands are gray um it's time for a cleaning and um you know if you don't know how it's not a big deal um just get rid of the ammo put it in a different room hop on youtube and you know say hey how do i clean and type in your model and you're going to find a hundred videos showing you how to do that and how do I disassemble, type in your model? You're going to have 100 videos showing you how to do that. There's really no excuse for not knowing the basics anymore. Yeah, and, and truly, the Internet has become a huge resource for us as gun owners. I mean, not only from the educational standpoint that you just brought up, but the connection standpoint, too. You know, being able to talk with people in the comments or connect with them via social media, however that is, is really, really valuable. And I think it's, you know, one of the key reasons why... We have so many gun owners today because it's no longer like a quiet society of like, oh, you can't talk about it. It's not like Fight Club. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that people aren't as ashamed of anymore or worried about the impact because they see and know so many people around them that they can connect with at a, at a real community level. Absolutely. And the vast majority of the community are, are great, normal, average people. But of course, uh, social media is a double-edged sword and it can be an incredibly toxic uh, place as well. Um, I tend to stay away from outlets that um, allow that sort of toxicity. Um, I think that uh, we as individuals, um, you know, we can't surround ourselves with negativity in general. And, um, you know, try to be positive, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, something so important as, as our rights, our freedom, our, our self-defense, our protections, that sort of thing. Um, so you've got to take the good with the bad and just kind of uh, uh, find the right outlets for the positivity and find a way to, uh, to, to ignore or dismiss the negativity. Um, so yes, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. The social media is a great resource, uh, but it is what you make of it. You've got to, uh, be able to, uh, to, to wade through the manure sometimes. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. So uh, let's talk just a little bit about politics. I'm not going to ask you who you're voting for. I don't care. That's not what I want to talk about, but um, you know, you have on your website the gun vote. Obviously, it's important that uh, everybody vote and vote for people that um, they feel represent their interests, right? Um, why do you have that gun vote 2020 don't risk your rights on the juliegollib.com website? Oh, it's, it's so, so important right now. 
Um, you know, I am not a single issue voter, um, but I am a major issue voter. <laughs> and my major issue is, of course, gun control and gun rights. And uh, it seems every time, every four years, we are faced with this huge decision of, you know, who to vote for based on this issue alone. I, you know, everybody says that supports the Second Amendment, that the Second Amendment protects the others. I firmly believe that. Um, and when you look at the track record of nations that have lost their ability to, you know, their, their populations to defend themselves, it's, it's a slippery, horrible slope of lost freedom. And so for me, it's, it means so much from, a, you know, not only a livelihood standpoint, but for protecting my family, my daughters in the future, you know, it's, it's, it's everything. So, um, for me, it's it's a no-brainer <laughs> uh, to you know really get the message out there for candidates that truly support the Second Amendment and those who do not. It's very very simple to see, um, and the NSSF is a great resource if you go to just gunvote.org or at the NSSF's website NSSF.org. They will point you in the right direction. Uh, they have report card information so that you can look at candidates that you may be voting for to help you decide on this issue. And then you can investigate them if they're, you know, if there are other issues you're passionate about. But for me, it's, it's absolutely critical, especially this election. I think you made a lot of excellent points about that. Um, number one, the uh, right to keep and bear arms protects all of our other freedoms. Number two, there is information out there as far as report cards, like you said, at NSF nssf.org but the third thing that you said was also so important was research them don't take anyone's word for it like hey who should i vote for i have literally heard people ask that question i don't know who you should vote for just because i want to vote for this guy doesn't necessarily mean that you should vote for him we're not going to agree on every single topic on every single uh, issue um you know, yes, I, I agree with you. Also, I am. I've been accused many times of being a single issue voter uh, because I've said I could never vote for anyone who is um, anti gun or like what I like to say pro civilian disarmament. Um, it, you know, that's at the top of my list. It's not the only thing. Of course, there's many, many other issues that are important to me as well. But um, you know, I think that that one issue per protects all of our other freedoms. So I, I can't vote for someone that, you know, what I'll say is, uh, wants to take our guns away, but then someone will always say, oh, they don't want to take their guns away. They just want common sense. What's your retort to that? When someone says they don't want to take your guns away, they just want common sense, gun safety, common sense, gun laws. You know, it's such a wishy-washy phrase, you know, common sense for some people is not common sense for others. You know, telling someone who, you know, is concerned about their safety that it's common sense not to is ridiculous. You know, at the end of the day, um, I, I really encourage people not to, to use common sense when they're talking about legislation because there's always details in there that make it nonsensical if, if it goes too far. I'm not a fan of big government. I, uh, I do appreciate laws that keep us safe, but you have to look at the details of everything. And just because it may make you feel better doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be good in the long run. And you always have to think about the not just what's happening now, but what could happen in the future anytime that you're looking at making any changes to legislation. I agree. Absolutely. And my opinion has been that, uh, you know, we've been compromising for nearly 100 years, starting with the National Firearm Act. Um, you know, in in all of this nearly 100 years of, of compromise, giving away a nibble here and a nibble there and a nibble here, sometimes bites are bigger than others. We look back and we see that we've an inch here, an inch there has added up to be miles. And um, is it keeping us safer? I mean, we really have to ask that question. Are we safer for it or not? And the reality is, and, and from my point of view, that it really making it harder here in Illinois, where where I am, oh, unfortunately, yeah. 
Here in Illinois, you know, we have a firearm owner identification card. Okay, so some people will market that as, you know, that's common sense gun safety to keep the, the guns out of the criminal's hands, except the criminals have access to firearms because they don't obey the laws. Um, and people who just want to legally exercise their right um, are having to wait. You know, I've talked to some people in my last class. The, I, I polled the students, how long have you been waiting for your firearm owner identification card? Uh, and there were students who three, four, one, even five months. I've wow. talked to people wow. seven Seven months, Julie, to get a That's permission so slip to 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 even not even buy a firearm, but to touch one uh, at a at a gun store. I'm interested in buying a firearm. I can't even touch one at a gun store until I have this card. I can't buy ammunition until I have this card. And then, so you're waiting, let's say, five months to to get the permission slip, and and then you go to the gun store. You want to buy the firearm. We have what's called a cool down waiting period in Illinois, and that's supposed to be uh, three days. You know, to make sure, hey, you're mad, you're upset, you want to buy a gun and shoot someone. So we're going to make you wait three days. Okay, except some people are waiting 10 and 14 days. And if you need a firearm to defend yourself when there's rioters down the block from your house, um, you know, how, how does the situation presenting itself now, how, you know, if you're waiting five, six months to, to, to be able to defend yourself, that, that doesn't compute in my mind. That doesn't equate safety. That does not equate common sense from any point of view that I can look at it. No, it's, it's control. It's all about control. There's nothing common sense about it. Yeah. I'm glad you see that. Well, I think so many, so many Americans are starting to, especially when they may have voted for legislation like an identification card situation until they find themselves in the same scenario of like, oh, well, I want this. Well, what did I vote for? This mm-hmm. is crazy. How, you know, and, and hopefully it serves as a, as a sort of wake up call for not just this issue of voting, but other issues as well. Anything that could potentially limit your First Amendment rights uh, and, and so forth. So it's it's really one of those, I find that when people look into the processes, especially in places that are not gun-friendly, New Jersey, New York, California, Illinois, and when they look into the procedures of how difficult it is to own a firearm, that they start to evaluate how much of a role government should have in their life anyway. Uh, you know, it's uh, if someone who grew up in New York, <laughs> I will never move back. I will never move back due to their one, their gun control laws, and two, just how they legislate lives in general. Something I think people need to be aware of. And there's a word for that called nanny state. They want to dictate like they're your nanny, everything that you you do, what you can eat, what you can't eat, what you can put in your body. And I, I try to govern my life by leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. And you should have the right, the freedom to do whatever you want so long as you aren't um, stepping on the, the freedoms uh, or hurting someone else. Um, I don't have to agree with your life choices. I don't have to agree with your decisions. I may may think some of your decisions are bad. I may think you're hurting yourself, but it's not my place to dictate to you uh, how you should live your life. It's not my place to say because I believe ABC or XYZ that you must as well. And I think just more people need to kind of sort of adopt that philosophy of leave me alone and I'll leave you alone, so to speak, mentality. Sure. It's the difference between dictating and educating, right? It all comes sure. down to that. So um, you mentioned a few times your your little girls. Why do you think it's important um, that – I'm, I'm sure you're bringing them up and, and, and educating them and training them. Why do you think uh, that's important? We hit on that just a little bit in the beginning about, you know, gun safety so they don't, uh, you know, stumble across a gun and, and, you know, hurt themselves or injure themselves. But ultimately – um, I'm assuming there's there's more. Your your vision is bigger than that. Oh, definitely. My husband and I want our girls to be self sufficient, self reliable. You know, being capable, uh, being able to handle anything that comes at them. And so it's our job as parents to give them the tools, whether it's learning about gun safety to start with, and then moving on to how to be proficient with various types of firearms, to learning how to you know, defend themselves in a, in a situation where they may not even have a firearm. All of those things, uh, teaching them to be aware of their surroundings. These are, these are life skills, right? <laughs> these are things that are important, you know, how to build a fire, how to cook a meal, all of the things that are going to help them become you know, 
citizens and, and good moral people in life. And so that's our mission. And, uh, you know, firearms do play a huge part in that. <laughs> I think, uh, I think when children learn uh, about the safe and the proper operation of firearms, it builds discipline that carries over to all walks of life. Um, it's not the kids who have been trained uh, to, to respect the tool, and that's all firearms are, is just another tool in our arsenal, so to speak. Uh, I've got screwdrivers, I've got wrenches, I've got knives, I've got firearms. It's, uh, you know, that's one of the things as, as human beings that make us special is we know how to, to make and utilize tools. And um, it's the it's not the children who are learning how to respect these these tools that are doing the the bad things with these tools. It generally speaking is uh, the ones who haven't had that baseline level of respect, uh, you know, hammered into them that are are the ones that are doing these things. Uh, it's it's you know it's that common adage of you have to start kids young. You have to teach them right when they're little so that they can you know, build on the foundation from there. And uh, it's, it's hard to being a parent. It's hard to juggle all of the things, but that's, that's the job you have, right? <laughs> it's the job you have and, and you need to do your best at it. Absolutely. That's my number one thing is to set my children up. I tell my kids all the time, it's not my job to do for you. It's my job to teach you how to do for yourself. And I will help you with anything and everything that you cannot do for yourself, but it's ultimately your job my job to teach you how to do it yourself. Um, I think that, uh, you know, that sets them up for independency and, and it will make them better people, better civilians, you know, contributing to society um, in, the, in the future and leave the world a better place and make them the best people that they can be. That's kind of my philosophy on parenting. Some call it tough love. I can't, I'm sure behind my back, my kids use different words about it, but uh, <laughs> the, yes. uh, hopefully they'll appreciate it in the future. I think they will. So, Julie, I know you're super busy, and I, I very much appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to me and, and the listeners and, and spread your information. I wanted to, to, to give you that reach because, you know, you did really have when I was, as I said, as I started out, when I was looking for that information, uh, you were a tremendous source for me. And I wanted to, with all the millions of new shooters out there, I wanted to, you know, hopefully introduce you to them. I, th I think it was very important important. As I said, you're excellent ambassador for the shooting sports, for the gun culture in general. Um, tell people how they can get a hold of you. Um, you know, you're obviously very uh, accessible. Um, you know, definitely tell them the best way if they have questions, if they want to check out your social media, if they want to watch your videos, you know, give them those resources. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Everything you can find about me is at my website. It's juliegollop.com. J U L I E G O L O B dot com. And you can find links to social media, blog posts. Uh, you can email me, all that good stuff, all in one place. Yeah, definitely check out her videos. I mean, they're so they're so educational, informative. Um, you know, they're they're not incredibly long. Some videos, it seems like people are just long winded because they're trying to hit that ten minute YouTube monetization mark. And I, I I don't get that from you. You know, you're doing this because you <laughs> enjoy it. You're not doing it for the the nickels per view that you get. You're doing it because you enjoy doing it. So um, that's that speaks volumes in and of itself. Uh, what closing remarks do you have for the listeners? Um, to you know, parting words to leave them with that uh, you know maybe will inspire them. Uh, definitely get out there and learn to use your firearm proficiently. Get some great training and check out gunvote.org if you need help on trying to figure out who you need to vote for. You definitely need to vote. <laughs> Julie, thank you so much for being on the show today. I, I Words can't uh, express my appreciation. I really appreciate being on. It's been fun. It's been fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm going to wrap it up. I truly thank everybody for listening. Julie, again, thank you for uh, being on the show. Everybody stay tuned to future podcasts. I've got some uh, – Great guest lineup, probably not as good as Julie, but I'm going to try. If uh, any of you have an idea for a future guest or if you'd like to be a guest on the show, definitely reach out to me at alphaconcepts.com slash podcast. As always, everybody, be armed, be trained, and be alpha. Mm -hmm.